Здесь у меня просто очевидная вещь. Ну, не сдавайтесь. Не надо, нельзя сдаваться. Если это произошло, это означает, что мы необыкновенно сильны в этот момент, раз они решили меня убить. Но и нужно использовать эту силу. Не сдаваться. Помнить о том, что мы огромная сила, которая находится под гнетом вот этих вот чуваков плохих, лишь потому что ну, мы не можем осознать, насколько действительно мы сильны. Все, что нужно для торжества зла, это бездействие добрых людей. Поэтому бездействовать не надо. Tuesday, February 20th, 2024, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow. I'll be your moderator today, joined as usual by two of my colleagues, the historian Neil Ferguson and the economist John Cochran. Neil and John are Hoover Senior Fellows. Ordinarily, H.R. McMaster rounds out our conversation, but the good general can't join us today, so we will soldier on, pun intended, without him. Uh, thanks in great part to our wonderful guest today, Dan Senor. Dan is the host of the Call Me Back podcast and author of two terrific books on Israel, 2009's Startup Nation and The Genius of Israel, which was published last November. Dan, in a past life, was a senior advisor to Paul Bremer in the U.S.-led Coalition Provisional Authority in Baghdad and a Pentagon advisor to the U.S. Central Command in Qatar. Dan, thanks ever so much for joining us today. Great to be with you guys. I'm a longtime listener and fan, first-time guest, although I will say several of your hosts have been on my podcast which which means there's one one man left out here, which uh, which I'll I'll make my case to P Professor Cochran later on to come onto the Call Me Back podcast. But we've had HR and we've had Neil. Yeah. So, so if we had more if we had more time on the show, I'd ask you. You did a show with Mike Murphy once, Dan, where I think yeah. you mentioned that Neil is one of your most popular guests. I'd like to I'd like to get the background on that, but maybe when you have you back again. So let's go to Neil, who is sitting in Jerusalem right now, having just come out of meetings with high ranking Israeli officials. Neil, to the extent you can tell us what we discussed, tell us what you learned today. Well, I learned uh, today and, and yesterday uh, that uh, the Israeli Defense Forces are defeating Hamas, and they are probably a couple of months away from completely destroying Hamas, not only as a terrorist force, but as the de facto government of Gaza. And uh, they are very reluctant indeed to heed international calls, including calls from U.S. officials uh, to have a ceasefire before this job is done. Uh, the other thing that I'm very struck by, and this is based not just on conversations with officials, uh, but also conversations with ordinary Israelis from a broad spectrum. I've been doing my my level best to sample opinion right across from the ultra orthodox to the secular left. Ordinary Israelis are are done with two state solutions as a conversation topic. They're done with it. And, and they feel, uh, however much they, they may disagree on certain political issues, they, they feel to me very united in regarding this as a quite inappropriate thing to discuss in the wake of the horrendous terrorist attacks of October the 7th. Uh, th those, that feeling is very striking to me. I found uh, greater national unity here than, than I think I was anticipating. I know, Dan, that you've been here recently too. I'd be interested to compare pair of notes, but that's, those are my two impressions. The, the government is not about to stop this uh, war against Hamas, uh, regardless of what is said to them uh, internationally. And people are broadly speaking behind this effort and very uninterested in talk of a two-state solution. Yeah, let's go to Dan. You you did a Call Me Back episode recently with your sister, Dan, that was just heart-wrenching and her talking about uh, the climate in Israel. Compare it to uh, what you experienced, what Neil just said. Yeah, I, I had the same impression that Neil has. I When I was there, I was meeting with a range of officials, of officials both in and outside the government. And even within the coalition government, there's a range of views, obviously, because many of the members of the government, including members of the war cabinet, are bitter political enemies. You know, Netanyahu and Gantz basically hate each other personally. Uh, Gadi Azenkot, who's a part of uh, Gantz's party, which is, and he's in the war cabinet, cabinet also, has been very public in his criticism of Netanyahu. And yet on the issues that Neil just spoke about, there's more or less unity. I went there in these meetings I had in Israel looking for daylight. And if you follow the press over here in the West, you, you're going there expecting there to be a lot of daylight, and there's virtually none. So take, for example, 
the issue of the two-state solution and this effort by the U.S. and the U.N. and some Arab capitals and the EU to try to push forward a very quick uh, declaration or recognition of a Palestinian state. The Israeli cabinet put out a statement on Sunday during their cabinet meeting that every member of the cabinet signed off on, including Gantz, including Eisenkot, that basically said, no way, we are not starting this process with a declaration of a Palestinian state. We are not going to make, they didn't use these words, these are my words, but we're not going to make October 7th Palestinian Independence Day. And that position is held across the board. And then you think about the political constituencies that could be for a Palestinian state in Israel, which did once exist and was very vibrant. A lot of it was was um, wiped out figuratively figuratively uh, during the Second Intifada. So meaning the left in Israel was dramatically weakened during the Second Intifada in the early 2000s when there were 140 suicide bombings, over you know over a thousand Israelis slaughtered. And this was after Ehud Barak had went to Camp David and basically offered Yasser Arafat everything, right? He offered a Palestinian state. He offered East Jerusalem as the capital. I mean, he was willing to deal with every issue. And Arafat walked out and Israel got the second intifada. So that wiped out a lot of the left's, you know, the, the political support for a two-state solution. And now what was left within the Israeli political left in the last few years was largely populated in southern Israel. In those kibbutzim, that is where the peace activists lived and were organizing and were working on coexistence with the Palestinian Gazans. And those are the people who are sitting in tunnels today being held hostage. Those kibbutzim were the ones that were raided. In 2014, which was the last time there was a major Israel-Gaza war with a serious ground troop presence, lasted about 50 days. It was those, those Israelis in the south that led the protest movement inside Israel calling on the Israeli government to stop the war because they wanted peaceful coexistence with the Palestinians in Gaza. And those are the Israelis that were slaughtered on October 7th and their communities were destroyed and many of them were, are being held hostage today. So like there's no, there's nobody in, in Israel right now, nobody really like on, on, on any of the fringes, nowhere can you find people that are arguing that that this is the moment to declare a Palestinian state. Can I ask you guys, um, and what about in Washington? It's hard for me to understand what our, our leaders are after here. When they say two-state solution, I would think the first part of the two-state solution is, oh, you guys who want your state, you have to recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state within uh, given borders and, and to be peaceful about that. That has to be institutional, encoded in an irrefragable way. <clears throat> I'm not just, or is it just here? you know, Palestinian, the PLO, the one organization everybody hates, right, in the center. Here, you got your own country, uh, and, you know, the, the uh, route to importing the rockets is over here. So what, what are they talking about when they say Palestinian state uh, in, in, in Washington, in Saudi Arabia, and so forth? Uh, <clears throat> I presume there's something more concrete than, than just that. And second, does nobody think about allowed so a lot of people around the world who want their own state, <clears throat> uh, you know, the Kurds would like their own state, the Uyghurs like their own state, is the answer is you, you get your own state if you kill enough Jews, uh, you know, do we, we reward terrorism here. I, I can't imagine that that hasn't occurred to them. So the question, sorry to wind around the question, in Washington, in Saudi Arabia, in the UN, in all the worthies who say to state solution, what are they talking about? And is there anything vaguely coherent here? Neil, you want to take it or should I? Dan, I, I think you should uh, you should yeah. go ahead because this is right. uh, much more your turf than mine. So I don't think they really know um, what they mean when they say Palestinian state. Uh, I think different parties here have different views in mind, I think, and different agendas. I think the Biden administration has a domestic political concern, which is they need to get images of chaos in Gaza off the front page of the press and off of TikTok. And they need to be shown in their mind. This is their view. I'm, I'm not I'm not saying I agree with them, but in their view, the people around Biden need to bring down the temperature on the Palestinian issue and on the Hamas war issue inside the United States heading to 2024 because they're concerned about the risk or they're concerned about the, shall we say, deflated enthusiasm among the progressive base. And somehow this issue has become representative to them of an issue that they need to bring to deal with in order to 
to deal with the lack of enthusiasm among the progressive bases, Biden head, heads into a re-election. I we can get into that. I'm I'm I think they are overthinking it. Uh, I'm skeptical that them dealing with the Israel Gaza issue is going to deal with their progressive base enthusiasm problem. But be that as it may, there's enough people around Biden saying that, and there are enough players in Arab capitals who they want two things, John. They want Hamas destroyed. Like everybody I speak to in the Arab world, really, like they all want Hamas gone. And um, and they also don't want this to be a political headache for them in their own countries to the extent it's a problem on the quote unquote Arab street. So they want Hamas gone. They want Israel to finish the job, but they want to be seen to be throwing a bone, providing something positive to, you know, the 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 peaceful, quote unquote, Palestinian civilians that have been as um as victimized by Hamas as anybody. That is that is their view. They need to show some momentum on that front. What does that actually mean, practically? It means what what I'm what 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 is emerging is some sort of declaration that there is going to be a Palestinian state. It, in Tony Blinken's words, a a um a time bound and irreversible. His words, which to to me are the two of the most dangerous words I've heard in talking about a Palestinian state. Time bound and irreversible. Now keep in mind that language has never been used before by the U.S. government. The 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 basis for negotiations that could lead to a Palestinian state have always been about the parties negotiating with one another directly, Israelis and Palestinians, without preconditions, just get to the table and negotiate. And it's not time-bound and irreversible. It's absolutely reversible, meaning if Hamas or Hamas 2.0 takes over the political leadership of a of a of a quasi-Palestinian state, you bet the, the process is reversible. So the fact that Blinken used the word irreversible to me is quite alarming. And and in the past, historically, it's always been milestone-based, meaning this is the path we are on. If the Palestinians meet certain milestones, then they will get more and more instruments and assets of sovereignty on a path towards full sovereignty. I don't think it would ever be full sovereignty, meaning I don't think anyone wants a future Palestinian state to have its own military or its own airport or or jurisdiction over its own airspace. But basically any path to sovereignty is going to be have to be milestone based. That's how it's historically been talked, talked about. I'm surprised, as I said, and to some degree alarmed by how the administration is not talking about milestones. They're talking about making a move quickly and immediately towards a Palestinian state. I, I don't know I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't think there's any political leadership in any Palestinian faction ready to take on the up the leadership of the state. So I think it's it's sort of like an empty declaration. It's like, it's just, they want to be able to say, the administration and the governments in the Arab capitals wants to be able to tell all the respective constituencies, look, we're doing something. We've we've done something never done before. We're, we're declaring and recognizing a Palestinian state. That's never done before. We're not sure what that means. We're not sure who's going to lead it. We don't understand. We're not sure what the path is, but it's happening and it's and it's irreversible. You know, the 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 spaceship has has taken off. They want it. They want they want that message. And again, to my earlier point, John, I I just think. First of all, I don't think that's what Hamas wants. So we can get into that. But I just think the message to the Palestinian people and to the broader Arab world is a very dangerous message to say. We, the, the West has never recognized a Palestinian state ever. October 7th happens, the biggest massacre of Jews in a single right. day since the Holocaust, and now we declare a Palestinian state. And there was a previous vision, the Abraham Accord vision at least, which is why don't we get you guys to be rich first, get prosperous, make a lot of money, uh, and then we can talk about political stuff afterwards, which as an economist always struck me like a great idea. Yeah, I'd like to uh, point you gentlemen to two dates on the calendar. One is Sunday, the February the 26th. Uh, this is Vladimir Putin. We're going to talk about Putin in the second segment of the show, inviting leaders of Hamas and PLO to Moscow for what he called a, quote, inter-Palestinian meeting. Neil, you are a criminologist on the show. I'm W. is that. I'd like you to maybe uh, get some thoughts on what you think Putin's up to. Then, Dan, I'd like you to weigh in on Rafah. We had uh, Netanyahu the other day saying that uh, Israel will assault that city. This is the southernmost city in Gaza. It's a population of about a million and a half people, which is about the size of Philadelphia. Anyway, Netanyahu has said that if the hostages aren't freed by uh, the first day of uh, Ramadan, which is Sunday, March the 10th, Israel's going in. So, Neil, why don't you... Uh, Give us some thoughts on Putin and then Dan Rafah. And, and Rafah, is it really, Dan? I've seen the phrase key flashpoint. Is it really a key flashpoint this word? Neil, Neil, you go first. 
Well, I, before I came to Jerusalem, I was at the Munich Security Conference, uh, which should really be renamed the Munich Insecurity Conference, in which Europeans couldn't decide what they were more worried about. Was it Vladimir Putin gaining ground in Ukraine, or was it Donald Trump gaining ground in U.S. opinion polls? But worried they were. Uh, and one of my uh, reasons for being there was to try and explain, especially uh, to our German hosts, why they needed to spend a little bit more than 1.5% of GDP on their defense. And uh, they needed to do it uh, not just uh, because uh, Russia is in uh, Ukraine and, and not just because Donald Trump might be re-elected president. They ought to do it actually for their own economic as well as uh, national security good. Now, what, what I... Uh, trying to argue was that you can't view the conflicts in Ukraine and Israel in isolation. They're part of a bigger geopolitical picture. And uh, in that picture, as we've discussed on Goodfellas before, there's a kind of axis of ill will. Behind Russia stands China. Without Chinese dual-use technology, the Russian uh, war economy would have ground to a halt some time ago. Uh, alongside Russia as a supplier of uh, drones and other equipment is Iran. Uh, Russia is a player in the Middle East, has been since Barack Obama let them back in at the time of the Syrian red line uh, crisis. And uh, bringing up the rear, last but not least, is North Korea, also a source uh, of weapons uh, for the Russians. Uh, the tendency at the Munich Security Conference is to have a panel over there about Ukraine and a panel over there about the Middle East and not to join the dots. One person who did join the dots, incidentally, was uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who gave a barnstorming speech I heard in which he said uh, rather more forcefully than me that we had to deal with these threats uh, as, as one, as a single uh, global threat. And if we saw it that way, we would realize that it would be folly to let Russia uh, win in Ukraine and folly to let Iran win in the Middle East. And Iran wins in the Middle East if Hamas survives. Iran wins if a, a Palestinian state looks like a concession uh, to terrorist action. Iran wins if the Houthis continue to disrupt uh, trade uh, in the Red Sea. Iran wins uh, if Hezbollah is poised on Israel's northern border with a far larger arsenal than Hamas has ever possessed. Iran wins if militias in Syria and Iraq are also converging on the scene. And so I, I do think it's extremely important to notice these connections. When Putin invites, uh, as, as you just said, uh, Bill, Hamas and other leaders uh, and other organizations' leaders, Islamic uh, Jihad too, to Moscow, uh, it's, you know, not so that they can watch the Tucker Carlson interview together uh, and swap stories. Uh, this is part of a coordinated effort to undermine democracy and, more broadly, the Pax Americana. That's, that's what's happening. And I'm kind of glad that Putin is so overt about it because it makes it easier to persuade people these things are connected. And, you, you know, however you may feel, about the plight of the Palestinians in Gaza. And no doubt, we should all feel compassion for those Palestinians who have nothing uh, but loathing for Hamas and who are now in the midst of a war zone that Hamas created. Nevertheless, you have to understand, Israel must defeat Hamas as surely as Ukraine must not lose to Russia. This is a global challenge we confront, and it extends all the way uh, to the South China Sea, to the Philippines, to Taiwan. Dan Rafa. Yeah, so I, I'd say two things just on, on Neil's point. I mean, if you think about who Putin is inviting to Moscow, the idea that any of these factions could one day populate the leadership of a Palestinian state is so preposterous. So start with Hamas, where Yehya Sinwar has been saying since October 7th that there are more October 7ths to follow. So it's not like he's been he's been jostled in any way, at least in his public statements. He would says he would do it again. You have Khalid Michel, who's one of the leaders of the political wing of of Hamas outside of Gaza, who two weeks ago was in Turkey and gave an interview, and he was asked about a two state solution, and he said there's no two state solution. He says there's a one state solution, meaning the Palestinians, Hamas, will be in charge of the one state, and that one state, to quote Khalid Michel, was from Russia Nikra up in Israel's north all the way to to a lot in the south and, of course, from the river to the sea. So we want to be clear, he wasn't just talking about the river to the sea. He was also talking from north to south, one state solution. So that's Hamas. 
Then you have the Palestinian Authority. Obviously, Palestinian Islamic Jihad is another version of Hamas. So same same version. Then you have uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority in, in the West Bank and Ramallah, which has yet, by the way, yet to condemn what happened on October 7th. Repeatedly, repeatedly cajoled and, and consulted and uh, and has refused to condemn October 7th. Uh, the Palestinian Authority, which still has in place its policies to monetarily reward anyone who, any Palestinian who attempts Palestinian violence, terrorist violence against Jews. They name, still name streets out of terrorists. They still provide monetary reward to families of terrorists who die in service of jihad, of slaughtering Jews. This is, the, the look at the textbooks in the schools in the West Bank, they're full of indoctrination uh, of, Jew, of Jew hatred. So, so there's no sign that the West. And by the way, when I speak to officials in Gulf countries and Sunni Gulf countries, they also say that that Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority is hopeless. There's no way that they could be the leaders of a of a future joint Palestinian state. So, who are these factions? I have yet to hear of a single player being invited to Moscow that is actually a real reformer that is willing to do the kinds of things that Neil's talking about in representing those Palestinian civilians that want some normalcy. And so, I I do think in that sense, it's clarifying, and I think. Our friends in the Biden administration who feel pressure to do something on the Palestinian state front, it is clarifying to say these are the characters who are being gathered by, Ob you know, by Vladimir Putin, who you are, who you are rightly obsessed with. And it just it, it's clarifying about whose side which players on in terms of Rafa, this this war. Neil is right that the Israeli leadership is extremely focused on finishing this war and ending it and they can't finish it without going to Rafa. They just can't. Uh, there's there's two, there's, you know, close to 20 uh, Hamas battalions, according to the Israeli leaders that have been, um, that have been wiped out. There's still a few more and they can't wipe them out unless they get to Rafa. Uh, unfortunately, there's well over a million Palestinian civilians currently concentrated in Rafa. The, everyone's putting pressure on Israel to figure out some kind of humanitarian corridor to get these Palestinians or a bunch of them out of the area and get them up to North Gaza. That is hard to do logistically. Uh, Israel's trying to do it. The risk, obviously, when you do that is a lot of bad actors will get out of Rafa and get up to the north. So how Israel does this in a way that doesn't have bad, you know, Hamas, remnants of Hamas sneaking up and getting safe haven up in the north, in the northeast of Gaza, back on Israel's, back on uh, Gaza's border with uh, Israel is is difficult. So I think this Rafa situation is um, is is going to be ugly, and it is necessary. And exactly what Neil said, the Israeli leadership that keeps saying we we are going into Rafa is important not only because they probably do have to go into Rafa, but it's also sending a message. The international community and pressure from the international community has been unleashed on Israel. Every Every part of it, right? The EU, the UN, the media, the NGOs, the, the, I mean, just, you know, obviously now increasingly the Biden administration, they're all pressuring Israel saying, you cannot do Rafa. And Israel is saying, we're doing Rafa. And I think that sends a very important message to Sinwar and the people around him like, wow. We believed we could catalyze a massive international response after October 7th that would put pressure on Israel to show some restraint. We knew they'd have to respond in some way, but to have to show some restraint. And this and the Israeli leadership saying, no, we're going. We're even going if we have to go in Ramadan is sending a message that you, you're unleashing everything on us, right? You're sending genocide cases to the ICJ. You're, I mean, you're, you're throwing everything at us, and we're still – going. That is a very important message, not only to the Hamas leadership, it's also an important message to all of those regional actors that Neil talked about. And, I'll, and I just want to say, early on in this war, there was a big debate about whether Israel should move quickly to negotiations for the hostages. And Defense Minister Gallant, Yoav Gallant, argued very strongly that Israel would do best on negotiations for hostages if they move aggressively militarily quickly. That is to say, Israel's negotiating position, to the extent that they have one, will be strengthened by a strong military response and will be strengthened by Hamas believing that Israel is willing to do whatever it has to do to wipe out Hamas and get the hostages back. And he he believes he's vindicated. Gallant, he has said this publicly. He believes that 
the deal that he got in the first round, which most on the Israeli side believe on that first round of hostages released was a good deal for Israel, was made possible because Israel moved so aggressively on the military front and convincing the people around Sinwar that Israel was willing to move aggressively. And I think that the the the, the statements you're hearing them articulate on Rafa are of that same strategy. I ask, um, uh, the north end of Gaza seems like a terrible place to uh, spend six months while Israel flames out the south end. The obvious place to go is Egypt. And it's interesting that the Arab states who say they want to get rid of Hamas and say they care about the Palestinian people will nonetheless not let a single one in. I saw a picture of the border wall that Egypt has. It's amazing what they're building. It's it would be Donald, like Donald Donald Trump's dream, dream. <laughs> to have a border wall like that. And and But yet a little bit of pressure from the U.S. Okay, you care about Palestinians? Uh, have, let them have a place. Now, obviously, we know we know this game. They are playing the game of of increase Palestinian suffering as a, uh, a deliberately increase Palestinian suffering as as a weapon against Israel. I want to ask you the economic question, though. Can how long can Israel hold out? Um, you know, there, there's if this goes, this will go on for months more. You got uh, every country in the world, including the U.S., now giving up on them. You you wrote a book on the Israeli economy. Um, prosecuting war is there's more and more sanctions, more and more, you know, whatever comes from the uh, from the rest of the world and perhaps a second front. It's going to be hard for Israel. Uh, how, how do they do it? So just to, on your first point, uh, it is true that Egypt and I agree with you, John, I think I'm amazed that there has not been more focus on the lengths Egypt is going to prevent any suffering Gazans into their country. The reason they're doing it is not only because they want to prolong the suffering, but I think the more. The, the more uh, paramount, the paramount, the overriding motivation is they don't want these people in their country. Oh. That's what it's about. They don't want, I mean, I spoke to, I spoke to an American official who was involved with getting out American Palestinians. So American citizens who are Palestinian that live in Gaza. And when the war began, October 7th, the U.S. government was focused, this got less attention, but the American government was focused on getting out these American citizens who were living in Gaza. And he described to me how they had to the, the the Egyptian government was so nervous about any Palestinian leaving Gaza and coming into Egypt that if the American government wanted to get out a U.S. citizen that was Palestinian living in Gaza, the U.S. government had to provide its own personnel to personally escort that that person not only through the border but once they're in Egypt. That American officials had to like man the 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 person in Egypt until they're on the in the airport and on the plane and out. So it's like they, they do not want these people in their country. Which the idea that Israel gets, you know, these these accu accusations of, of you know, quote unquote apartheid and you know, the, e Egypt. If this really is their concern, Egypt could solve this overnight if they were willing to take in uh, some Palestinian refugees. On the economic front, so the worrying news is. Uh, I'm not worried about Israel's tech sector. Let me start with that. So if you there's about 400 plus multinationals with major operations in Israel, and it's all the big companies, you know, Google, Meta, you know, Intel, I mean, Apple, and then and also a lot of non tech companies like Procter and Gamble and the major auto companies, they all 400 plus major multinational companies have, you know, very expansive operations in Israel, not a single one of them has announced they're shutting down since October 7th. Uh, so I, I I think that speaks to the deep tech and the deep innovation that, that there are D centers in Israel are doing, and you don't just like unplug that quickly. So the good news is uh, they're staying. They seem to be sticking it out. And some of them made very strong statements about why they're sticking it out. Venture capital, Israel is, you know, attracts more global venture capital globally on a per capita basis in any country in the world, obviously it's down, but it's also down globally. So there's, so it's, it's hard to disentangle what's a secular trend in terms of global cap, global venture capital fundraising in terms of what's going on in tech globally versus what's happening in Israel and its war. The downside that I'm more focused on is just the simple reality that something somewhere between for the last four months, somewhere between 10 to 30% of the senior executives of most tech companies in Israel have been called up to fight in reserves. And there's just a reality that that head of business development that was working on closing a deal with an American company or, you know, some marketing, ex you know, they're just not there. They're gone for four months and they're fighting and stuff falls through the cracks. And that, that segment of the economy, which is the engine of the economy takes a hit. That's inevitable. Now, 
partly because of the economic pressure, the reserves are coming back, meaning they're 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 being they're being reintegrated to society. So the so most of the fighting in the near term, and that could change, but most of the fighting in the near term is going to be the regular army and not and not the reservists. So hopefully that pressure on the tech companies is going to go down. We'll see though. Uh, because there could be other fronts that open up. And they all talked about the north. I mean, there's other stuff that could happen where we could Israel could be back back in it again, having to call up hundreds of thousands of reservists. Uh, I think, and this is not me trying to look at this with rosy eyed uh, through rosy rosy eyed lenses. I will say though, when I wrote Startup Nation, we looked at uh, Saul and I looked at the the history of you know like the '91 Gulf War where Saddam Hussein was launching Scud missiles into Israel that the Israelis believed could be laced with chemical weapons and the whole economy shut down and everyone was in gas masks and sealed rooms and the tech innovation and the and the and the interdisciplinary skills and the and the kind of uh, initiative taking mindset that came out of that period helped fuel a tech boom for the next couple of decades it's not by accident that you know international investors view Israeli entrepreneurs as the most resourceful they are they are unique uh, mine and Eric, uh, mine and Neil's mutual friend Eric Schmidt told me when he was at Google, he said if you take the average Israeli twenty-five-year-old and you put him or her up against their peers anywhere in the world, he told me at the time this was in around two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Google will hire the Israeli twenty-five-year-old any day of the week because they just have a level of maturity and interdisciplinary skills and leadership during pressure and crisis management skills that no young tech executives have anywhere in the world. He says, Google will hire the Israeli over anyone else any day. There's just no comparison. So if you think about what these tech executives that are being called up are dealing with now, many of them in their 30s and 40s, and now they're going back to their tech companies. And I just think, I wouldn't wish this upon any of them, but the reality is many of them are you're going to see a whole other level of maturing and crisis management skills. And so I, I think ultimately in the long run, the Israeli tech economy is going to be fine. My bigger question is Israel's military industrial base. I think that one wake up call for Israel these last few months is how dependent it is on the U S for yeah. munitions and, and other defense capabilities. And it's not to say that the U.S. government is playing games with them politically. I do not think they are. I think the Biden administration has actually been very strong on this front. They're trying to get Israel whatever Israel needs. And, and the White House has gone to extraordinary lengths despite in, in the face of dysfunction in Congress to get them what they need. But the, the reality is there are supply chain issues in the U.S. that Israel can't do anything about. There's other priorities the administration has vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine that Israel can't do anything about. And I think there is this wake-up call. I picked this up in a bunch of meetings I was in, that Israel needs to pivot dramatically and quickly to building out its own military industrial base. And the, I think ultimately that's probably good for their economy. But in the short term, it's a huge pivot. It's going to require a big in increase in defense spending. And that will have real economic implications that I think could be um, quite costly. So let's leave it there, gentlemen. Um, Neil, I hope you have a column in the near future. You've been to Kiev and you've now been to Jerusalem. And I think I think a contrast between the two wartime footies would be fascinating to uh, to read about. So hopefully that's uh hopefully that's somewhere in your mind right now. That is that is actually what I woke up at four in the morning thinking about, Bill. That is exactly the contrast that I'm going to write about for my uh, column on Sunday. Uh okay. it's it's a fascinating one. I'll tell you one thing, just to sign off on this topic. Ukrainians Global communications are so far vastly more successful than Israel's. Uh, Ukraine has really uh, aced global communications, and and everyone here admits they're quite clear about it that this has gone horribly wrong. And I think one thing I'm struck by is that Israelis are shocked at how unpopular they've become, uh, particularly amongst young people on both sides of the Atlantic. This has been a rude awakening. They could learn something from the way the Ukrainians do this. And I've been uh, offering some tips based on my trips to Kyiv. Excellent. Look forward to it. Dan, it's proof that no good deed goes unpunished. I want you to stick around for our second segment. We're going to talk about the mysterious death of Alexei Navalny. Mysterious in this regard. Uh, Navalny was seen in court just prior to his death. Mysterious also in that we don't know his cause of death. I think Russian government called it sudden death syndrome, whatever the heck that means. Neil, I want to play game shows host here with you, and I want you to choose between what's behind door number one, two, or three. 
Door number one, Neil, is the timing of this. This comes uh, right before the Russian election, which I think is on March the 25th. Door number two, Neil, would be what's next for Russian opposition? Can uh, can Navalny's wife, Yulia Navalny, can she step in and continue where he went? Or door number three, if you want, Neil, which is his legacy? And here I turn to our colleague, Michael McFall, uh, the Hoover senior fellow and former ambassador to Moscow, who wrote the following in the Washington Post, quote, Navalny dreamed of a free Russia, while barbaric dictators such as Putin can kill men, but they cannot kill ideas. I do not know when, but I am confident that Navalny's ideas of freedom will outlive Putin's ideas of tyranny. Well, let me go through uh, that third door. Uh, when he went back, I said to my wife, Ayan, he's choosing martyrdom. I wonder if that will work. I was talking to a Russian uh, journalist now in exile uh, at Munich at the security conference, and he said, no, he didn't think that it was martyrdom. He thought he would be Mandela uh, of Russia, the Mandela of Russia. So I think that fundamentally he underestimated uh, how utterly ruthless Vladimir Putin is and how much he is the heir of the uh, the KGB tradition, mm -hmm. and indeed the Stalinist tradition. Uh, I mean, in some ways, dissidents uh, by the time of Brezhnev had uh, had a better chance of survival than dissidents under Putin now. So we really have gone back to a very dark time, uh, to a Stalinist time when opposition led to death, to the, to, led to the gulag and then to death. Uh, the idea is a cheering one, and I want to believe it, that Navalny will prevail and that ideas of freedom will ultimately transcend the tradition of despotism mm -hmm. uh, in Russia. His widow has vowed to carry on uh, his struggle. Uh, it is nevertheless quite hard to see signs that... Uh, that spirit is going to uh, to stand a chance as long as Putin lives. He has created a fascist regime uh, in Russia. This is something that I predicted a long time ago, uh, 24 years ago, in fact, when I said that Russia had become Weimar Russia under Yeltsin. And you know what came after Weimar? That was a point that I made in a, an article way back when in 2000. And with a kind of Sickening inevitability, Russia has gone down the exact same path, the fascist path and the path of uh, aggression against its neighbors. Uh, so Navalny died. I, I would love to believe that ultimately uh, his spirit will prevail. The consolation is that the fascist regimes do all die, but they have to be defeated. They tend not to self-liquidate. And it was only after the Third Reich had been decisively defeated, crushed, uh, obliterated, that the tradition of freedom that did exist in Germany before 1933 was able to resurface. So in the end, I think Mike McFall will be right, mm -hmm. but only if this regime can be defeated. And until there is a greater stiffening of resolve in Europe and in the United States and a recognition that this Russian fascist regime must be defeated, then I'm afraid Navalny and all the other people Putin has killed uh, will not have the satisfaction beyond the grave of, of ultimate victory. Neil, when the Russia-Ukraine war began, I remember there was a lot of speculation as to whether or not Zelensky would leave, would get out of Kiev, may even get out of Ukraine, and that the most important strategic and symbolic decision Zelensky made was to lead the defense of Ukraine from inside Ukraine. And to your earlier point about Israel, it's part of his, the story, the myth, the, the, the global um, PR, which I agree has been both, both impressive, but also very authentic that he's been there in the fight. Do you think Navalny could have been Navalny if he were not in Russia? I mean, do you think he ultimately made that calculation? You, you make the comparison to Mandela. Mandela fought the fight often mostly from a prison, but still he fought the fight from inside South Africa. And Navalny, on the one hand, he he probably, one would think he knew there was a risk that his life would end if he came back to Russia. And yet, if he wanted to be Navalny, capital N, you know, the image that he's, the symbol he's become, sort of like Zelensky has become this massive symbol, 
You can't do it if you're not in the country that you're fighting. I disagree. For. And I, I would here quote our colleague, uh, Steve Kotkin, who's long argued that there needs to be a credible government in exile. Uh, would de Gaulle have uh, become uh, the leader of a, a free and democratic France if he'd given himself up uh, to the Nazis? No. No, I think this was a mistake. I said it at the time. I, I said he's chosen death. I'm not sure that's the right decision. But he believed he had to go back to Russia. And I think he just miscalculated and thought that he could be Mandela. Looking back on Mandela, the Afrikaners were ruthless, but they weren't so ruthless as to kill him. Uh, but Putin doesn't care. Like a truly uh, evil and fascist dictator, he is prepared not only to invite the leaders of Hamas, the, per the perpetrators of October the 7th, to Moscow publicly. Not only is he prepared to do that, he's prepared to murder the principal leader of the opposition uh, in, and he tried to, to murder him before when he was abroad. So this is what we are up against in, in Putin. Uh, and, and it is a, it is a, a shocking and, and dismaying reality that now the Russian opposition, now the people, the many Russians I know who yearn for a democratic Russia, they don't have a leader. He's dead. I, th I think Navalny had to go back because he wanted to be the leader of an internal opposition. De Gaulle came back at the, with foreign armies and no one's gonna invade Russia and depose uh, the regime uh, at least any time in the future. And there's plenty of governments in exile uh, that you know, are, I think the Habsburgs are still sitting around waiting for someone to call them back and <laughs> it, it's not happening. I, I have to salute the tremendous courage of the man. Whether he knew he was gonna be a martyr or hoped he would be a Mandela, he knew there was a chance. And, and not since the Christian martyrs of the third century have, have I seen that kind of courage. But I also want to point to, uh, you know, why did it not work? Yes, he may have underestimated the ruthlessness of, uh, of Putin and company. Uh, yes, the Afrikaners were at least decent enough that they were not going to murder uh, Mandela in person. I also think um, he counted on being famous enough that Putin wouldn't dare. And uh, thanks to Scott, who looked up the quote for us in uh, 2021, uh, Biden warned of devastating consequences for Russia if Navalny were killed in prison. One more line in the sand. I think there was a feeling that if you were important enough, Russia wouldn't dare because the rest of the world would do something awful enough to it about Russia. I think this is another sign of, of deterrence being gone. Uh, I wonder what devastating consequences the Biden administration has in mind. Um, maybe, God forbid, allow the Ukrainians to win their war or something of the sort. But it's clear Putin knew he could get away with it. And, and there is an element of our deterrence, of the sense that there are limits you can't go beyond, even if you're Putin, even if uh, you're a dictator, that, that that sense is gone. We have just a couple of minutes left here. I'd like to get uh, the panel's thoughts on Tucker Carlson's sit down with Putin. This was eight days before Navalny's death, a two hour interview in which Putin just basically rambled on and on uh, interminable history lessons, uh, then later trolled Carlson by saying he thought he'd get asked tougher questions. And then Tucker uh, saying something afterwards he'd like to take back where he said that basically he said, quote was, quote, every leader kills people. Leadership requires killing people. Dan, this is somebody in the podcast space with here. What, what are your thoughts on what uh, Tucker's trip to Moscow tells us? It was embarrassing. Uh, it, um, I mean, I, I, look, I don't want to. You want to pile Tuck, on? Yeah, Tucker's doing what Tucker's doing. I don't, I don't quite get what he's doing. It's uh, to, so at leaving Tucker aside, I, to the extent what he's up to is is emblematic of something broader going on on the right or on elements of the right. That's what worries me in the United States. Um, there is uh, now. I, I will say. Trump has said a lot of things about Russia and Putin that we don't like. He still has not come out, and I'm not I'm not trying to bait him here, uh, as I know he's a loyal listener of the Goodfellas podcast. But uh, Trump has still not come out against aid to Ukraine. So there are a lot of people from Tucker Carlson to J.D. Vance to Josh Hawley and Rand Paul and Mike Lee in the Senate who are against aid to Ukraine. And I can't figure out if they are like the vanguard of something or they are like out on a ledge and they're going to be embarrassed because if Trump gets elected president, he will provide aid to Ukraine. He has not come out against it. So 
I, I, I've been going back and forth trying to figure out is the Tucker kind of J.D. Vance crowd representative of something really big going on that we should be worried about? Or is it actually just a lot of noise and the press likes to cover what they're saying and doing disproportionately? Uh, and in, in fact, is ultimately not that relevant. And the bipartisan consensus on on defending countries like helping to defend countries like Ukraine against threats from Russia will endure. Um, again, I swing back and forth. I'm I'm obviously hopeful it's the it's the latter, but um, but you know I'm I'm at the edge of my seat. John, quickly, your thoughts. I think um, we have to try to understand people. So why are people on this kind of fringe of the right uh, ready to throw in the towel? Well, they might have lost a cousin in Iraq and are wondering why. They might have lost a brother or sister in Afghanistan, which we lost that. It took us 20 years to lose that war. They ask why. Uh, Ukraine, we're kind of ready to give up the fight after after two years. And, and they go, hmm. Uh, Israel looks like uh, we're ready to give a give up and lose that one after three months. And and these are the people who fight and die in our wars. And I think they're ready to back an America that wants to win and wants to knows what they want to do. But they are skeptical of send more of my relatives uh, and friends and maybe me off uh, to incompetently led um, uh, exercises that we then give up on and retreat from. I, I obviously, you know, I'm I'm a big hawk, and I've been our Ukraine hawk all along, if that's possible. And, and I think Israel needs to absolutely win this war. But um, and I don't think it's expressed well. And I don't want to in, encourage Tucker Carlson and then then this this Putin adoration. But I, I think we can under we should understand why the people who fight and die for these wars are wondering: Are the people in charge competent at what they're doing? Neil, you get the last word. I am beyond disappointed in what Tucker Carlson has become because four years ago, he was an impressive and effective broadcaster uh, whose monologues I used to enjoy. I mean, Tucker, I don't know if you listen to this, but you have a chance to admit that you made a terrible mistake by going to Moscow that you were made use of uh, by a fascist dictator. Uh, you don't want to be the Walter Durante of this story. You don't want to be uh, the the useful idiot uh, of American journalism who fell for a dictatorship. So, you know, my advice is own it. You You made a huge blunder and you need to admit it and recognize that you have been used by a fascist regime. And the fact that Navalny was killed just after you had uh, been made a fool of in that interview, where Putin filibustered, made stuff up that you didn't know enough Russian history to correct, right. all of this has all but destroyed your reputation. And the only possible solution is a full and frank apology and an admission that you screwed up. All right, gentlemen, on to the lightning round. Lightning round. We begin with a question from one of our viewers, John in Australia. He writes the following, quote, Republicans are trading U.S. credibility at home and abroad for short-term political gain at the cost of U.S. hegemony. When the invasion of Ukraine began, I recall the U.S. heroically proclaiming they were backing the Ukrainians until the end. Given what is happening now with the Republican Party's continued blocking of Ukraine aid, and why should a country like Korea, Japan, Australia, or Taiwan trust the USA with future commitments? Dan, why don't you take it? Yeah, I I I agree. I I think the combination of of us looking like it looking like Ukraine is if they're not losing, they're not winning the war. And the impression that the U.S. is backing off to some degree from the, from Israel. Now, I, my only caveat is we're 130 plus days into this, and the U.S. is still standing with Israel. Uh, previous wars, 2006 Lebanon War, it was 34 days before the Bush administration told uh, Israel, it's over, stop. Uh, 2014 Gaza war that I mentioned earlier was about 50 days. If you would have told me four months, four plus, five months into this, the Biden administration may have concerns, may be flashing a yellow light, but is not flashing a red light, I would have been shocked. And so here we are. So I think, you know, 
on balance, we're doing fine with regard to Israel. I have concerns, but if it looks like we're getting shaky on Israel and if it looks like we're failing on Ukraine, I think there's going to be more and more bad actors around the world. They're going to continue to test us. And, um, it, it worries the hell out of me. John. What is the chance the U S would actually go and fight for Ukraine? We're, we're not even, you know, we're talking about providing some aid to Ukraine, not actually us fighting there. So the rest of the world, um, you may be a lot more on your own than, than you think. And I, I say that very sadly as a big believer in Pax Americana, but, um, you know, wait, waiting for the, waiting for the, the, the cavalry to come is a dangerous or a dangerous strategy. And, and I don't like a world where everybody is arm, armed up to the teeth either, but, um, you know, count, counting on the Americans to come and fight for your country, given what's going on now seems, and, and given, by the way, we're going to be tearing ourselves apart for the next four years, especially if Trump, Trump wins. You know, Neil, Neil, George Schultz always said trust is the coin of the realm. So how good is us currency these days? Well, uh, John, our, our viewer, uh, didn't mention the abandonment of Afghanistan, which uh, I don't think can be blamed on the Republican Party. The question uh, targeted Republican uh, blocking of Ukraine aid, but I think uh, the interruption to uh, aid to Ukraine has a lot to do with the, the complex politics uh, of the House of Representatives. This is a bipartisan failure, uh, in my view, because uh, the Biden administration uh, successively failed to deter the Taliban, to deter Putin, uh, to deter uh, Iran, uh, the backer of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So it's a bipartisan crisis, but I don't think it's uh, over. I think actually this can be salvaged. I think aid will probably get through the House and be restored to Ukraine. I don't think, having listened to Mike Pompeo, uh, that the Trump administration uh, is necessarily going to be an isolationist administration. The last one wasn't. Uh, and so I don't think it's time for Australians or anybody else uh, in Asia uh, to give up on, on US commitment. Uh, th this is a really critical point. There was much too much talk I thought in Munich of the end of the transatlantic alliance, but it's not uh, over any more than it was over in 2016 when Trump won the last time. Look at the national security bench he's likely choosing from. I don't see many isolationists. Parker Carlson's not going to be Secretary of State. And in that sense, I think uh, people should calm down a bit and recognize that mistakes in foreign policy have been made by both parties over a prolonged period, but America is still number one. And there's no other Pax than the Pax Americana available. Our final question, we have just a couple of minutes here, gentlemen. I apologize for the brevity of it. The American Political Science Association is out with its uh, rankings of the American presidents. Number one, Abraham Lincoln. Number two, Franklin Roosevelt. And number three, George Washington. Joe Biden is 14th and Donald Trump is 45th. Neil, thoughts? I think George Washington should be number one. I mean, Dan, you know about startups. It was a startup nation then. He's got to be number one. Sorry, no, no debate. Wait a minute, Bill. Where's Ronald Reagan on that list? Reagan is 16th. He is two slots behind Biden. What? For... How many and did the Cold War? Were in That's the... ridiculous. Uh, I would How many gentlemen? Republicans were on the panel? May I ask? 154 political scientists, 15 Republicans. You do oh, make. thank you. Uh, that's about the right ratio. Yeah. John, what do you think? One, Tear two, it up. Two. Delete. Delete. <laughs> delete. I want to, uh, uh, as a uh, market economist. I'm not quite as much a fan as Roosevelt, as everyone seems to be. Uh, most of what he did, a few things were good, uh, but most of what he did made the Depression worse, uh, but made it seem like he was in charge. <clears throat> um, winning World War II was a decent thing. Yeah, I'll go with Washington one and Lincoln number two. Washington, especially for not becoming king, probably the most important thing he did. And I want to uh, put in a little word for, for my friend Calvin Coolidge. For disclosure, I sit on the board of the Calvin Coolidge uh, Foundation, which is a wonderful organization. But li little quiet Cal um, uh, did some pretty remarkable things, uh, especially got the booming economy of the 1920s going. His uh, motto, his Harding's motto, but he, he took it too, was return to normalcy, uh, a motto I think, along with a cut in the tax rate from 70 to about 25 percent, return to normalcy uh, and an economic boom, that, that wouldn't be a bad thing for us to emulate. Dan? I would, I would, my top five would be Washington for the reasons Neil said, Lincoln, Reagan, and Truman. Reagan, for the reasons I said, won the Cold War, deserves a Nobel Peace Prize for that. And uh, Truman, obviously, for 
uh, ending this, w winning and ending the Second World War, and taking a huge number of risks, uh, not the least of which what he had to do with Japan, which was probably the toughest decision a president commander in chief has had to make. And apropos of our earlier earlier part of the conversation, his decision to recognize the state of Israel, which was by no means an inconsequential decision and had enormous pressure uh, among his advisors, uh, and he stood up to them. So th those are my those are ones that I think should rank very high. And we will leave it there. Dan Siener, go out and go skiing with your family. Neil Ferguson, you be safe in Jerusalem. Enjoy your meetings. Look forward to your column on Sunday. John, you and I are in a very soggy California. Stay out of the rain, my friend. Thank you. And that's it for this episode of Goodfellas. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. We'll be back in early March with a new show. Until then, take care. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your support. And we will see you soon. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org.